everyone, welcome. I see everyone is joining us individually here as the waiting room has been opened. I'll just give it a moment or two for everyone to be able to <clears throat> settle in on the screen here. There we go. Great. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's virtual alumni event. My name is Joy Fitzgibbon. I'm the acting director of the Margaret Macmillan Trinity One program here at Trinity College. And it is my great privilege to host and moderate this evening's presentation by Dr. John Meehan, as he explores the question, is Canada still a leader in world affairs? A timely question. <laughs> Following tonight's presentation, uh, we will have time for questions. And I would encourage you to submit your questions um, throughout the presentation. I will be watching for them. Uh, and please submit them using the Zoom chat function. Okay, I assume that at this point in the pandemic, many of us are familiar with the Zoom chat function, uh, but you'll see the chat is usually at the bottom of your screen there. And you'll be able to submit them to me. So you'll see my name, Joy Fitzgibbon, a little arrow, please click on that and submit them directly to me and I'll be collecting them and organizing them uh, for John as he, um, after he's done his talk and as he um, responds to our inquiries and comments. <clears throat> we will be trying to answer as many of the questions as possible uh, this evening. So uh, I will do my best, judicious best to get to all of them. And a recording of tonight's event is going to be available on the Trinity College YouTube channel at a later date. So you can revisit and enjoy uh, this evening once again. Before we get started, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Dr. John Meehan. So John is a historian by training and he has a bachelor in history and Russian studies from McGill University a diploma in theology from Magdalen College, Oxford, an MA in international relations from the School of Advanced International Studies, SAIS, at Johns Hopkins University, and a PhD in history from the University of Toronto. His publications include The Dominion and the Rising Sun, Canada Encounters Japan, 1929 to 1941. And this was the winner of the Prime Minister's Award in Japan. And Chasing the Dragon in Shanghai, Canada's Early Relations with China, 1858 to 1952. A former president of Campion College at the University of Regina and the University of Sudbury. He has taught and published on Canadian foreign relations, Asia Pacific studies and relations with indigenous peoples. Dr. Meehan is no stranger to Trinity College in the late 1990s while completing his PhD at the University of Toronto. He was Trinity's academic dawn in history and social sciences. John, of course, has returned to Trinity and we're so grateful that he has uh, in, as the new director of the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History. So John, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us in the midst of what is a very busy evening for you. Uh, we look forward to what you have to share with us. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joy. And it's an honor to be here. And uh, as you say, it's great to be back at Trinity. And I see the faces and names on the screen. And I see uh, students who were here when I was at Dawn. And I see uh, former employees of Trinity and alumni. It's really, really an honor to be back here. Um, I, I really love being history Dawn here uh, when I did my doctorate under uh, Bob Bothwell. So I finished that in 2000. And um, now back as in a new capacity as director of the Bill Graham Center. Well, uh, is Canada still a leader in world affairs? What a top, timely topic. Uh, I didn't, obviously didn't plan these events, um, but I'm sure uh, in your questions, we'll be referring to current events. Even though tonight, what I wanna do in, in a half hour basically is, is fairly informally um, talk about Canada as a leader, um, where, we've, where we succeeded as a leader and where we failed uh, but basically be future oriented in terms of where we could go. Um, the basic uh, line that, I, uh, that I'll be taking tonight is that Canada has been a leader in global affairs uh, for many decades, but that our leadership has suffered in recent decades and uh, it's not too late to regain it. So um, 
as I say, this takes place against three major challenges uh, in terms of our leadership in the world, in terms of international relations generally. We're in the midst of a global pandemic, as you know, it's not over yet. Um, Six million dead, according to the Economist, more like 18 to 20 million. Uh, climate change and the uh, challenges that that has posed. Um, UN declaring a code red in terms of global warming. And of course, the war in Ukraine. And uh, what could be more timely, uh, because just a matter of hours ago, President of Ukraine, uh, Zelensky, addressed our parliament in a very moving, urgent, and personal plea. And for those of you who heard it, uh, it it's impossible to hear that and not be moved by what he said. Uh, comparing um, sites that have been bombed to sites in Canada. Imagine if the CN Tower were bombed or Vancouver and talking uh, directly to Justin, our prime minister. So this is timely indeed, looking at Canada's role as a leader. So what I wanna do in, in the time that I have is sketch out uh, a little bit, the first part of this legacy of Canadian leadership. What has been Canada's role as a leader in global affairs, the history and where we are now? Um, separating a little bit fact from fiction. And I think you'll hear in the first half of my talk, um, a fair amount of criticism on, on where, we, where we have gotten to as a leader in the world. But I wanna shift gears halfway through to look at future directions. And um, I don't pretend to offer any solutions tonight to these very complicated problems, but as a historian, uh, what can we draw from history uh, to help us chart a course to becoming a leader again, based on Canadian successes in leadership and especially on Canadian interests and values. So to the first part, what's been our legacy as a leader in world affairs? And for that, I could pick 1945 as a starting point, but actually I'm going to pick June of 2020. Why June of 2020? That is when Canada lost its bid for a seat on the UN Security Council. As you know, there are two seats on the Security Council uh, that are rotating, that are temporary, and we narrowly lost out to Norway and Ireland. Now, we had failed in an earlier bid back in 2010 under Stephen Harper um, in another tight race where we lost out to Germany and Portugal. And for many Canadians, it was seen as a blow that we thought we were great leaders in, in international affairs, and why would the United Nations not pick us uh, to take one of these seats on the Security Council? It came as a great blow to the Trudeau government, which had spent about $2.5 million in a very costly bid of campaigning, reaching out to world leaders, diplomats, and organizations to secure a seat on the Security Council. And in the postmortem that followed, many people were trying to assess the reasons why Canada didn't get it. Well, there's the obvious one that we were a late entry, that Ireland and Norway had begun their campaigning much earlier, back in 2005 and 2007 respectively, and Canada only in 2016. But the, the deeper long-term reasons were that Canada had, had failed as a leader in many areas, in development assistance, in peacekeeping, in fighting climate change, and even in human rights, even though Canada presents itself as a champion for human rights. And uh, issues that were cited with regard to that were um, on the Palestinian question, and uh, in supplying armored vehicles to Saudi Arabia in its fight in Yemen. So I choose June of 2020 as a date where um, kind of a, a coming of uh, a prise de conscience, the French would say, uh, coming a realization that perhaps we're not the global leaders we thought we were. Oxford English Dictionary defines leadership in this way. Leadership is the ability of an individual or a group of individuals to influence and guide others to a desired result. I prefer Dwight Eisenhower's uh, definition of leadership where he says, leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. So leadership means influence, of being able to influence other powers uh, towards a desired result. And when we reflect on the last, since World War II, we see Canada really, in many ways, starting off on a great track for leadership. And, and really, it's in four main areas. The first is our commitment to multilateralism. Canada, since 1945, has been a leader in many multilateral organizations. The United Nations, we were there at the at, at, at present at the creation, in the words of... Um, uh, Dean Atchison, the U.S. Secretary of State, 
We were there at the San Francisco conference. Uh, we've been a, a strong supporter of the United Nations from day one. We're a founding member also of NATO, as you, as you know, insisting on the inclusion of Article 2, which made of NATO not only a military organization, but aspirations to be a political and economic um, organization too, for collaboration. We've been part of the G7, the G20, Commonwealth, Francophonie. Um, and the types of diplomats we've had who have promoted this leadership role, Lester Pearson, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, Louis Saint Laurent, Hume Rong, Norman Robertson, S. Scott Reed, Lloyd Axworthy, and the list goes on and on. Over those decades, we established a strong reputation as a middle power, a helpful fixer, an honest broker in what, what has been known in history as the so-called golden age of Canadian diplomacy from about 1945 to 1968, although we could quibble about the end date. It was rather an artificial time to be leader in the sense that after the war, two great powers were destroyed, Germany and, 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 and Japan, which had to rebuild, and Canada emerged with the fourth largest military. So it was somewhat uh, artificial in that sense that this strong leadership role uh, couldn't go on. But still, through multilateralism, we had many successes. One was referred to today in the House of Commons by Elizabeth May, where she talked about the Ukrainian crisis and how we need creative solutions to this crisis as creative as the um, as Lester Pearson's suggestion of a United Nations emergency force uh, to help resolve the Suez crisis, for which he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Canada has been part of so many peacekeeping operations from Cyprus to Congo, uh, and about 130 Canadians have died in peacekeeping operations. Canada has been a strong Cold War ally, uh, a firm, um, staunch supporter of peacekeeping. But by the 1990s, we noticed that reputation beginning to slip for many reasons. By the time we get to uh, the 1990s, we have a shift in peace, from peacekeeping to peacemaking, where peacekeepers, Canadians and others, are being put in situations where there is no peace, where, and these are difficult situations indeed. In Bosnia, the Balkans uh, in the 90s, many of us remember the Somalia affair, where Canadian peacekeepers were um, uh, guilty of abusing a, a civilian. And who could forget Romeo Dallaire's uh, tra tragedy in Rwanda of UN peacekeepers not getting the support they need. Again, in situations where there is no peace to keep. So we've seen a steady decline in this since the 90s. That's coincided with uh, a decline in our commitment to defense, uh, a very complicated military procur procurement um, uh, procedure, which has really hampered our uh, effects at national sovereignty, including in the Arctic. And so with the Ukrainian crisis, we see NATO facing this existential threat. And as we know, uh, well, here give, to give you some uh, facts here on our commitment to peacekeeping, back in the 90s, as I say, when our role began to change, about one-tenth of pe total UN peacekeepers were Canadian, about 1,000 were from Canada. By 20, 2006, 16 years later, that number had fallen to 130 of 70,000 peacekeepers, very small percentage. Uh, by 2019, it went up slightly to 176 Canadians. And now by last count, as of last fall, the total number of Canadian peacekeepers in the field is 59. 42 men, 70, 17 women, of whom 31 are police. In terms of peacekeeping today, Canada ranks in 75th place behind Lithuania. And the top three donors to peacekeeping missions are Bangladesh, Rwanda, and Ethiopia, showing that peacekeeping also has highlighted um, regional powers. So countries that are involved in conflicts regionally are investing more heavily in this than Canada is. So for many, that first kind of role of leadership in terms of multilateralism, peacekeeping, um, Canada might not even get a passing grade. A second area of our leadership uh, over the last few decades has been in development assistance. This was done initially through the Commonwealth with the Commonwealth Plan in 1950, where we very skillfully adapted the Commonwealth to be a source of development funding for countries like India and other Commonwealth countries. 
It was later expanded to include Caribbean countries and um, Commonwealth Africa. And of course, with the rise of the French back with the quiet revolution in Quebec, uh, we applied that to French Africa. And then somewhere in the 1970s, Canada discovered Latin America, that there were Latin American, country, Latin American countries that could also benefit from development assistance. By 1968, when CETA was created, we had a commission report, the Pearson Commission, which set as a target uh, for development assistance, 0.7% of Canadian GDP, um, a scale that we've never reached. The closest we've come to it is in the 80s under Mulroney, we reached about 0.5% of GDP. And if projecting forward by 2000, that had fallen to 0.25%. It's up slightly today, today to about 0.31%. Although Canada is the eighth largest OECD donor uh, of the DAC, the Development Assistance Committee. So that's where we are as a leader in development assistance. A third area of Canadian leadership since 45 has been in the area of human rights. The Canada has championed human rights around the world ever since we signed the Charter of the UN. And as you may know, one of the main authors of the first draft of the UN Declaration of Human Rights was a Canadian, John Humphrey from McGill University. But interestingly enough, even back at that time in 1948, Canada was one of nine nations that initially abstained from the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Why? Along with several other nations that included South Africa, UK, Australia, and US, we wanted to have included a domestic jurisdiction clause to prevent UN intervention in domestic affairs. And these in particular related to treatment of certain immigrant communities, such as the Japanese Canadians during the war, um, indigenous people and uh, effect on the Padlock Act in Quebec. There, was there were reservations from the Canadian Bar Association, as well as important members from the federal cabinet. But eventually, pre pressured by many of our allies and not wanting to be in the same camp as countries like South Africa, Saudi Arabia and the Communist bloc, we voted in favor of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Even after that, we had a concern for state sovereignty and really didn't incorporate human rights strongly into our foreign policy until the 70s. We, we did have the Diefenbaker stand against apartheid, which was picked up by the Mulroney government in the 80s, as it truly did use the Commonwealth Multilateral Forum to challenge apartheid. We also had a defense of human rights in Latin America in the 1990s. More recently, as some of you may know, uh, in 2007, the United Nations passed the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and unfortunately, Canada was one of four countries that voted against, along with the United States, Australia, and New Zealand, four countries with significant Indigenous populations, and that this we did not endorse it uh, until a few years ago, 2016. Um, we continue to face some criticism over, as I said, our sales to so Saudi Arabia, um, as well as um, the place of human rights in our relations with China over Tibet, Xinjiang, and Hong Kong. So leadership and human rights, uh, I don't know what you would give us on, a, uh, uh, on our scorecard, but it's been a mixed result there too. I suppose the fourth and final place of leadership in, that we've played in, in global affairs has been on the environment. At the Rio summit in 1992, the Earth Summit, Canada was considered at the forefront front in the fight against climate change, partly because of our role in the Montreal Protocol, uh, banning substances that, in order to protect the ozone layer. Um, and we were the first G7 country to ratify the treaty. Mulroney, uh, Prime Minister Mulroney at the time, seemed committed and optimistic about Canada's role in fighting climate change. And again, if we look at our performance on this score since then, we see less than impressive results. With the Kyoto Protocol of 2002, uh, which set as a target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 6% from 1990, le 1990 levels, our emissions actually went up by more than 30%. And as you know, under the Stephen Harper government, we officially withdrew from Kyoto in 2011, arguing that it was pointless to continue if the US and China were not included. Uh, we've had the Copenhagen Accord since then, and uh, the Trudeau government's signing of the Paris Agreement in 2015. 
But at COP26 in uh, Glasgow last fall, Canada was ranked 58th. Or, uh, sorry, we went from 58th place down to 61st place uh, as ranked by the Climate Change Perform Performance Index. We were rank ranked with the very low performers in company with other um, uh, nations such as Algeria, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. So I, I present those four areas as of areas where we've had mixed to not so impressive performance as a leader in global affairs. Uh, peacekeeping in the last few years, development assistance, human rights, and the environment. But I wanna shift gears slightly with you to move toward um, areas where we've been successful as a leader in global affairs. And I think as we look forward, and I know we'll bring Ukraine into this discussion, um, it's important to carve out a niche for us in global affairs as a leader based on our strengths, our successes, our areas of competence, our Canadian interests, and especially our values. Now we've had many um, uh, Secretary of State for External Affairs who have emphasized our values in our foreign policy. People like Lloyd Axworthy, Christia Freeland, if you've read her response to the Ukrainian crisis. But I actually want to uh, just present to you this evening um, a very coherent uh, presentation of our foreign policy based on interests and values presented a long time ago by Louis Saint Laurent in what was known as his Gray Lecture given on this campus at U of T in January of 1947. Now this was obviously quite a different context 75 years ago, but I think we can take the four principles he outlined to kind of present our um, leadership role in international affairs and bring it forward to look at how we can develop a coherent leadership role for Canada in 2022 and moving forward. According to Louis Saint Laurent, Canada had a distinctive role to play as a leader in world affairs. He outlined what were foundations of Canadian policy based on principles, national interests, and values. He also, also outlined that our networks and relationships are key. But Canada as a middle power cannot go it alone. We exercise our leadership within multilateral networks. And that's as true today as it was when he gave this speech in 1947. So I just want to outline for you four key values that, were, that Saint Laurent outlined that I believe are still relevant today, even though they've taken on a new form in our context. The first Canadian value was national unity, that our foreign policy has to be shaped around maintaining national unity. Now in Saint Laurent's day, of course, this was between the two solitudes, Cat, French and English. But even in 1947, he recommended that this applies also to sectionalism of any kind, as he called it, based on regions or classes. Saint Laurent was keenly aware of the divisions in this incredibly diverse nation of Canada. And if we project to 2022, we see that national unity includes not only the English and French realities, but many other groups and populations. As you know, in recent decades, um, various provinces have established international relations, trade offices. Uh, they're included in Team Canada missions under Jean Chrétien uh, in, in Ch to China. But let's not forget also the immigrant experience and how Canada has, despite the challenges and we are certainly not perfect on this score, but I do believe that Canada's experience of immigration and pluralism and accommodation of refugees is something that can be shared with the rest of the world. It's not perfect, but it has been studied by Germany and many other countries facing challenges in this area. And um, we've looked at gender relations. Again, our score, our, our performance on this score has not been perfect, but again, we've incorporated uh, aspects of gender equality in our foreign policy in terms of how we approach the developing world, uh, Afghanistan, et cetera. And I believe too that um, the role of indigenous peoples is something, although our record on this count is certainly um, something that we are now examining very critically. Um, it's interesting that in 2022, it's the 100th anniversary of the visit of a Mohawk chief, Chief Deskehe, 
to the League of Nations in Geneva. And I talked earlier about Canada's flip-flop on UNDRIP. But it's interesting to note, I was at a, a meeting last week of the members of the Arctic Council. And it was quite interesting to see the Finnish representative say that in Finland, they have started a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that's modeled very closely on the Canadian example, which in itself had adapted the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. Again, Canada is not perfect on, in, in any of these areas, but I do believe that national unity and presenting a, a, a foreign policy based on national unity, unity includes these voices. These should be part of our foreign policy goals, a more inclusive foreign policy, just as we've taken great pains to develop an inclusive foreign service and um, made up of uh, Canadians of a diverse background experience, including Indigenous Canadians and Ukrainian Canadians for that matter. Our diversity, I think, is a great strength on this value of national unity, going well beyond probably what Louis Saint Laurent foresaw in 1947. We may take that strength for granted, but I know from my travels and my experience in other countries that many countries look to Canada for leadership in these types of issues. The second area of value, values that Saint-Laurent identified in 1947 was the pursuit of political liberty and the rule of law. That after the horrors of World War II and experience of fascism, that Canada had a leadership role in promoting democracy respect for international law, self-government, independent judiciary, and human rights around the world. And we've done that with some success and some failings, as I pointed out earlier. Here too, the, the situation in 2022 has changed considerably, where Canada has Canadian support for democracy, democratization, and human rights has uh, been uh, promoted around the world by people like Louise Arbour, parliamentarians, lawyers, uh, judges, uh, and policing uh, authorities. We know that uh, the Canadian version of uh, life, liberty, and happiness might seem rather boring, peace, order, and good government. Um, um, in fact, it makes me think of uh, a sign I saw for the counter protest in Ottawa, for the trucker protest, where somebody is walking around Ottawa with a sign saying, make Ottawa boring again. But the fact of the matter is, for much of the world, peace, order, and good government is a pretty good thing. And our example of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the legal reforms we have in place are another area where we can provide great leadership. And it seems to me the current Ukrainian crisis is exactly that. We see the democratic reforms that have occurred in Ukraine over the last decade, and Canada has been a, a significant supporter of these. And these cannot be allowed to fail that when the time comes for Russia to leave Ukraine and for Ukrainians to get their country back, that Canada will play a leadership role in restoring the rule of law and democracy to Ukraine. Uh, a third area that uh, Saint Laurent outlined in his 1947 speech was around human values, that beyond uh, real politic, Canada can play a leadership role in promoting um, the rights of individuals, moral precepts, and standards of behavior. And I think since 1947, this has expanded to include all kinds of areas, not only of political rights, but also social and economic rights and health and well being. What we've seen expressed in the Millennial Development Goals, which Canada has promoted. And this would cover everything from maternal care uh, around uh, women's health and flourishing, education of girls and other uh, poor and marginalized pandemic preparedness. And I think a success in this area is the banning of landmines through the Ottawa Treaty of 1997 and the role played in that by Lloyd Axworthy. And that was interesting because it, it occurred outside the regular multilateral form of, of disarmament where Canada assembled other like-minded countries to actually bring about change on this issue. And it's kind of an interesting example of Canadian leadership in a, in a very creative way. And then the fourth and final area um, that Saint Laurent cited um, in his 47 speech was Canada could play a leadership role, plays a leadership role by accepting and carrying out its foreign obligations. And here he talks about the Commonwealth, the United Nations, NATO, and bilateral relations. He mentions the US, UK, and France, uh, but alludes to others. 
Here too, I think Canada could do a much better job at pulling our weight. Um, there are some successes here too. I mentioned Mulroney's champion uh, leadership uh, against apartheid through the Commonwealth of taking a multilateral organization and using it to exercise real change in the international forum. The United Nations, which needs support these days, but also reform. And we've looked at re including reform of the Security Council itself, a very difficult issue. And not to mention NATO itself, which was in a very weak situation, especially given the last US president, but I think has been galvanized by the Ukrainian crisis uh, which has really posed an existential threat to NATO, where NATO is looking not only at its purpose, but at its membership and demanding a greater commitment from its members. We've seen in the last two weeks, huge changes. Uh, countries that show us that change is possible, such as Germany doubling its uh, military expenditures, such as Switzerland abandoning its traditional neutrality to support sanctions, and Sweden and Finland also considering uh, coming under the NATO umbrella. I mentioned Arctic security earlier. That is an area that's going to become increasingly important for Canada due to climate change and as the North opens up. And we know already that Russia, I think, has built something like 40 nuclear-powered um, icebreakers. China is also building icebreakers. Uh, these are far beyond what Canada has available to protect our North. And this is going to be a place for leadership in the future. I was going to comment on Ukraine in greater detail, but I think I'll leave that for the questions. I'm sure it will come up. But I just want to finish to say that Canada still has a leadership role to play. Despite the failings of the past, I think there is there have been significant successes. And that moving forward, our leadership role will be based on our strengths, our areas of expertise, our partnerships, our national interests, and especially our values. We need to look at areas in which we've excelled, to lead by example, and to collaborate with others to achieve results that are consistent on our core interests and values. And uh, I know that my, my small little role of doing that is in the field of education. And I'm so grateful to be here at the Graham Center um, in collaboration with the, the Monk School and the International Relations Program to actually form global citizens who are going to take this role seriously as they move forward into the future. So maybe with that, Joy, I'll just uh, finish on that note of evaluating some of our failures over the last few decades, but some areas where we've been successful and that I'm hopeful as we move forward. So thanks very much for your attention this evening. John, thank you so much. That was uh, so thought-provoking, extraordinary uh, insights, and, and I really loved the way you were bringing in uh, Saint Laurent's speech and then and drawing us into a potentially more hopeful uh, space, given uh, some of the mixed uh, record that you identified, uh, but the great potential that I think uh, is there. I would also just say, you know, looking at our undergraduates that are coming through here in, in resonance with your last comment, um, there are many students, I think, that very much hold a lot of the values that you were identifying uh, in that speech by Saint Laurent. So it also, that also gives me hope uh, as well. Well, I have many questions I could ask, but I think that would be abusing my position as moderator. So I will begin by going to uh, our chat here. We have, uh, actually, I'm hoping to get to all of these questions, but we'll see here. Uh, but we have one question from Lynn. Uh, Dr. Meehan, could you speak to Canada's feminist international assistance policy? What is the global perception of Canada's commitment to this approach? Now, you mentioned this before, and I, I know when Prime Minister Trudeau first raised this issue, there were some you know, people who were very um, emboldened or um, empowered by this, and some who went, well, what's he, is he going to do this or not? Like, what's he, gonna, what, what's he going to actually do uh, with this policy position? So what, what is your assessment of our track record there? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm not, it's not an area of expertise uh, of, of mine per se. Uh, it's still a fairly new direction, um, but I think we've seen it, uh, actually, um, we, we have some, we recently hosted a book launch here at the Graham Center of, uh, maybe some of you were at it, of a biography that's just come out on Flora McDonald, and it's called Woman in a Man's World. And if you look at the uh, cover photo, it's Flora sitting with Joe Clark's cabinet, you know, all men uh, in dark suits, and she's wearing a, a bright white dress. Um, 
And uh, so many uh, people on the call uh, talked about Flora McDonald as such an inspiration. And the book gets into aspects of what she did after she got out of politics, and that was to go over to Afghanistan itself and help in uh, humanitarian assistance and especially the education of, of, of girls in Afghanistan. Um, I think Canada does have a plate, obviously not only Canada. Um, we, uh, we had an event last week actually looking at the role of women in diplomacy in public life. And we had the Swiss ambassador here. We had um, Lieutenant Governor Dowdswell, who is a former diplomat, to talk about the role of women in international affairs and how women can bring a different perspective to conflicts and how disappointed they were to see, for example, when you look at, uh, well, uh, the current negotiations between Russia and Ukraine, uh, not a single woman around that table. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I think Canada has 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 is moving ahead. For example, even on things like a foreign service that's more representative of of of, uh, of women at the table at all levels. Um, so I, I think that's been going on for a few decades now, and I I think that is going to bear fruit. It is bearing fruit, um, and I think we see it joy in our students. Uh, I think most of my students are women. Uh, in mm -hmm. my class that I'm teaching this semester, and many have um, a desire to enter the foreign service. And so that, that, that bodes well as well. But also commitment to things, like I said, maternal health, um, education of girls. Uh, I think people do look at Ken as a leader in these areas. Um, and it's not, I think it even predates Justin Trudeau, uh, who came to power as a feminist prime minister, uh, quote unquote. Um, I think that's an area of value that I said, as I said earlier, where, again, from our perspective, we see there's such a long way to go in Canada on gender equality. There's no country that's achieved it. Uh, but again, this is a comparative thing. There are other countries that look to us as an example in this area. And I think, again, we play to our strengths. This is an area where we could exercise even more of a leadership role. Yeah, that, that's, thank you. That's so thought provoking in terms of um, the multifaceted aspect of what um, a feminist international assistance policy actually looks like, representation on a whole range of, mm -hmm. of issues. I was, when I saw the question, I was also recollecting of the, um, the fact that many of our non-governmental organizations who do overseas development assistance have for many years, even predating uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, been focusing on um, engagement of women in a whole range of various development projects and and how you work in cultural sense situations with the kind of sensitivity to the the situation that women face there and so i've heard since he put that policy in place and then put a call out for funding of ngos um, that you know whenever those ngos now are presenting uh at global affairs canada you know gender is actually right on that that mm -hmm. proposal right it, it's right. it's not only and I think this is an important point. It's not to get simply, okay, well, if I put that on there, then I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be able to get support from the government, although perhaps it is drawing people uh, into that agenda, but it's also that it's validating some things they were already doing as Canadian NGOs, mm -hmm. and they've understood the importance of it in line with the MDGs, in line with rich community-based knowledge, you know, so it's actually great to see the government um, encouraging that. Uh, it was already happening, but I think it, it sort of validates it in a way that perhaps yeah. enables more activity. I think it predates Justin Trudeau, obviously, and it, I think it's something that's going to only continue in, in Canadian foreign policy. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it's like that saying, you, you don't really know your country until you leave it. I, I think uh, for those of us who have left Canada and spent time overseas, uh, you begin to see Canada the way others see us. And I think that's very helpful for us to see that Again, like I said earlier, our role on immigration has certainly not been perfect if you look at our history, but still countries who look to us on immigration, on TRC with Indigenous, uh, again, not a perfect record, but who are actually uh, adopting certain of our policies that they see as helpful for their context. Mm -hmm. So I think leadership, Canada's leadership in global affairs is going to include things like that moving forward. Um, and again, it's not to blow our own horn because certainly there's a long way to go. But um, I, I think those are areas, uh, good governance, uh, that is something that we've been involved with for a while and I, I, is a, such a huge need in, uh, if we look at failed states around the world. Um, and certainly once this Ukrainian crisis ends, and it will end, um, the nightmare will end, uh, mm -hmm. there'll be a huge need for Western assistance in rebuilding Ukraine and Canada has to be there. 
Absolutely. Um, I, I'm going to go to a question um, that I also have here on Ukraine. What should Canada be doing with regards to Ukraine at the present? So you've spoken to the rebuilding um, phase and you had some thoughts on Ukraine. So this might be a good time to, to introduce that. Well, like everybody, I'm, I'm horrified by what's happening. Uh, how can you watch uh, President Zelensky speak and uh, Ky Kiev's being surrounded as we speak. And uh, the latest reports are it could fall as early as today, tomorrow, the next few days, we don't know. Um, Ukrainians are giving uh, an, an amazing fight to the Russians. Um, um, and with the calls for the no-fly zone, um, I think even Elizabeth may acknowledge this, that what are we supposed to do? Do, do we, will this risk promoting a, a, a larger conflict that could possibly go nuclear? Uh, could we not set up a limited no-fly zone over um, to protect the, the lines of humanitarian assistance? Uh, we've imposed sanctions on more than 900 plus agencies and individuals. Uh, we have our 500 plus troops in Latvia, another 3,400 troops available for NATO uh, deployment. Um, I, I see Canada's leadership here in three main areas. The first is, again, going back to the multilateral leadership form, that we need, we need a strong NATO. We need to be active with other countries. And, um, you know, NATO's been neglected. We've got to live up to our NATO commitments um, on this. Uh, and so to promote that in any way we can. The second area is human security. Uh, I was glad to see Justin Trudeau talking to the Polish leader. Uh, Poland is going to reach a saturation point very soon, if it hasn't already, in terms of accommodating um, Ukrainian uh, refugees and to find some way of fast-tracking immig immigration for Ukrainians so that they can leave uh, the countries they're currently staying in, uh, Poland and, and Slovakia and other East European countries, and come to Canada, where there's already one of the largest Ukrainian populations outside of Ukraine, if not the largest. Um, and, and accommodation of refugees. And it seems to me we've got some expertise in the area of immigration and refugees and human security. And I suppose a third area, and I have to be careful how I mention this because it could sound slightly opportunistic, is energy security. Hmm. That at a time when Europe is going to be cut off or is, is uh, placing sanctions against Russian oil and gas, that seems to me that um, this is an area where Canada could help our allies. Uh, Germany and, and the rest of Europe in helping them achieve their energy security as we all eventually move to more um, uh, sustainable energy uh, sources. So those are three areas I think that we can help. But do I have the answer for uh, Canada solving the Ukraine? I, I admire Elizabeth May saying uh, we need a creative solution like Lester Pearson's uh, idea during the, uh, the um, Suez crisis. Uh, but what that is exactly uh, it hasn't emerged yet. Um, but I think Canada is with the rest of the world uh, doing what we can without provoking a larger conflict. Yeah, and I guess the risk of, uh, you know, it, the challenge is reading Putin. You know, what is his intentions? And we have some of the, the best minds, policy uh, scholars, as well as those who've worked closely with him. And they don't agree on how far he will go if we put a no-fly zone in place, uh, you know, uh, is he just, is he going to go beyond Ukraine? Is he going to touch a NATO country versus not a NATO country? There's no consensus on that. Um, yeah, and so uh, that yeah. makes the calculation so much more difficult. I'm struck too by the parallels with uh, the 1930s and appeasement, um, mm -hmm. especially the uh, claim, Russian claims about Ukraine resorting to chemical warfare, which yeah. many experts are saying is possibly preparing for some sort of Russian use of chemical weapons. If that happens, it'll be even harder for the rest of the world to stand by and watch this happen. Yeah. Um, when we possess the means to uh, hope, probably stop some of this. So politically, it's gonna become more and more difficult. What is the line that you cross when you, be, when you actually, when NATO enters into war against Russia? This is gonna be, blurry indeed. Um, what is Putin's goal? What is his end game? Yeah. I find it very difficult to believe he can take Ukraine and keep it. Uh, even if he puts his own puppet regime in place, which 
we could very well do. Um, I don't know, I don't see how Russia can win this. Um, Russia is going to be more isolated than it's been. Um, and uh, you know, not only do my thoughts go to the uh, Ukrainian people, but increasingly to the Russian people, uh, many of whom, uh, uh, I mean, this is not in Russia's long-term interest to do what he's doing. So we'll see how it plays out. Um, yeah. it's, I think the next, the next week could be critical, but I, 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 I do not see how Russia can win this long-term. It, it looks like a massive miscalculation on yep. Putin's part. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So we have, I'm, I'm going to try to skillfully uh, ensure that everyone's questions uh, are able to be addressed. We have a couple of questions here that are coming in and I'm gonna lump them kind of under challenges of Canadian foreign policy governance in the context of bureaucracies. Um, and so there's one here, we can see that Robert sent it to everyone regarding your mention of the military procurement process. And he makes reference to the fact that, um, let's just see, I note that most countries actually have major problems with getting projects done on a budget and in originally planned schedules. To take a couple of examples from the country with the largest military budget in the world, the US curtailed its F-22 fighter program as it came to be seen uh, as to be even too expensive for them. And the F-35 program took longer uh, and was of course not as cost effective as it was expected to be. Do you think there are specific weaknesses in the Canadian defense procurement system that can be addressed? Um, yeah. given these difficulties. Well, uh, for those of you who know me, I'm not a, I'm not a war hawk, uh, but it seems to me that we've neglected our, our military for a long time. Um, we can go back to the Trudeau years, I suppose, where, where, where it started, but even since then, to the point now where even if we were going to uh, uh, exercise a no-fly zone in, in Ukraine, what do we do that with? I mean, we've got CF-18 fighters that are decades old, up against uh, Russia's latest uh, uh, aircraft. So, um, and as I pointed out earlier, um, Arctic sovereignty, uh, we've got a few patrol vessels up against Russian nuclear powered uh, icebreakers. So we've woefully neglected our defenses uh, for a long, long time. And I think the defense procurement is just part of the bigger picture. Um, it's interesting at the Arctic conference that I was at last week that I mentioned um, I think it was uh, one of the Scandinavian representatives uh, uh, was saying, look, Canada, uh, you've ordered some uh, icebreakers and they'll probably be finished in about five or six years from now. Something like that. If you want, we could sell you some uh, more quickly if you'd like to buy them. Uh, so we really have to get our act together on this. If we're not able to produce them, then yeah, we have to get them from other sources. But um, we've neglected it for a long time. And I think that... Uh, um, Again, I'm not usually uh, somebody who's going to uh, argue in favor of large defense expenditures, but in a case where they've been so neglected, um, you know, it is quite astounding to see Germany double its, its military expenditure like, like it just did. I mean, that, that is a huge, uh, huge change in, in their practice. So we're woefully un, unprepared um, and uh, we rely on, on, on the protection of the United States for sure. So uh, these are areas that we have to look at carefully uh, as, as we, we try to course forward as a leader. And I would put that under Saint Laurent's fourth principle of just pulling our weight when it comes to our international commitments. Uh, we don't want to uh, uh, be on someone else's coattails. We want to give our fair contribution to NATO as we do to all of our uh, multilateral organizations that we belong to. Yeah, it seems that there, um, there's a slower decision-making process uh, around policy reform within Canada um, mm -hmm. on some of these on some of these issues. I mean, we've been talking about Arctic sovereignty for quite some time, and the Canadian government has moved somewhat slowly on that uh, on some fronts, right? So it's, it's yeah. I mean, I remember this from even when I was in undergrad. <laughs> this was yeah. coming out. That was a little while ago, you know, so uh, that's... I don't, yeah, well, yeah. The, the Arctic discussion was quite interesting because... You know, it's almost like we're in a new paradigm. Uh, yeah. Several representatives said they would not come to the meeting if the Russian representative were there. And so the Russian representative had to be disinvited so that the rest of us could have a constructive conversation. And the dream of, of the Arctic Council, which was multi-collaboration in the Arctic, now um, people are saying it's going to take a, gener a generation till that can be, uh, till, till Russia will regain the trust of anybody. 
Mm. So we're in it. We are in a new era, and um, Canada, which relies on a commit, commit, commitment to multilateralism, is is in a new space as well. We've got um, two very strong powers, Russia and China, who for whom multilateralism is not a priority, uh, who are willing to go it alone, and uh, this puts Canada in a very vulnerable position. This, this actually ties in with a question, a couple of questions that I have in front of me here. One from David, who has said, I recognize that you've been focusing on internal decisions in Canada, but could you comment on all, uh, at all on your thoughts regarding Can China and what Canada's position regarding China should be? And it also ties in with somebody else's question that said, um, you know, this, this age of middle power is, is, has ebbed very much in line with what you're saying here, that this really is a new era. How can Canada act as a leader for a new generation of middle powers entering this area of, era of great power competition? So you've addressed, I think, some of that in your talk, um, but maybe in the context of particularly the rivalry between China and Russia that you just raised. Yeah, well, it's funny because you said, as you said in my background, my first degree was in Russian studies. So I actually studied Russian for four years and I visited the Soviet Union. And I kind of moved from that to more Asian studies and I write on Japan and China. And uh, yeah, I am worried that China, of what, how China is going to react to this Ukrainian crisis. Uh, is it going to use this as an opportunity to move on Taiwan? If the US or if the West is not able to um, challenge Russia in a meaningful way over Ukraine, does that embolden China to take some sort of action against Taiwan? Um, those are, those there's a possibility of that. I think our China policy has, has, has failed. I, 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 um, you know, if, if you remember the Kretchen years, our strategy was, you know, it seemed as incredibly naive from our point of view, but the strategy back then was trade with China. And the more we trade with China, the uh, richer they become, the, the more their middle class grows, and the more they will demand human rights. And we've seen that that hasn't happened. Um, and what I said earlier about Putin, I think would apply equally to Xi Jinping. Uh, I'm fascinated by Xi Jinping. I've been following his career and how he's leading China. But I do not think that Xi Jinping is in the best long-term interests of China. I think he's going to continue to isolate China from the world system by setting up a, a, a kind of a rival a network in Asia and some sort of combination of Russia and China, like we saw at the... Uh, with Putin and Xi Jinping at the beginning of the, the uh, Olympics, Beijing Olympics, signing this, I forget how many pages, 10, 15, 20 page uh, friendship agreement, I think should cause all of us to worry. Um, this is the new reality we're in. And I, I, as much as I, as a historian, love to go back to historical parallels, I, I, I think we're in uncharted territory here. My dream would be, we all want Russia and China somehow to return to the international system. But I'm afraid in the current scenario, that would only happen after some sort of change of regi regime in, in either of those countries. Do you see the conditions within Canada and our decision-making processes um, regarding defense and foreign policy as moving towards that um, you know, very strong commitment to NATO and being able to, and somebody mentioned in another question, punch above their weight. Um, do you think we're, we're actually prepared as a country to make this commitment that will be required to deal with this great power rivalry? Because to be perfectly candid, I'm looking at our colleagues to the states, and that makes me terribly nervous. I mean, even Joe Biden, you know, I mean, there's pros and cons to removing himself from Afghanistan, certainly. Um, but I mean, even the way he went about doing that, I mean, he does not want to be engaged, right? He does not want to be engaged mm -hmm. militarily. But I feel that we could be entering, like you do, a, a period of time of potentially great instability. Well, Bi Biden may have his faults, but I prefer him over his predecessor. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> that was a disaster. I'm probably not the only one on this call who might say that. But I mean, with, with Trump, there was a real uh, neglect of NATO. And not just NATO, but of partnerships, of diplomacy, of, of multilateralism. And I think Biden marks a refreshing return to that, uh, you know, despite his America first policy and, and things like that, I think we're going to see out of the Biden administration's greater collaboration, greater emphasis on NATO, um, but he's walking a very fine line uh, because, um, you know, we, we co-hosted a, a session on Ukraine uh, last week and uh, the experts who were there were saying, you know, the threat of a third world war is not that remote. 
Um, it's one thing for Russia to attack and try to take over Ukraine. If it tries something similar in the Baltics, which belong to NATO, we're in an uncharted territory because NATO is bound, is, is bound by, by the NATO treaty to defend those countries. So that is something that should all cause us to stop and ponder. And I think today, you know, the Ides of March, see the Ides of March today, to hear President Zelensky address our parliament is a huge, should be a huge wake up call for every Canadian to, realize that, to remind us that we are not, we do not live in a fireproof house. house. We are not immune from the conflicts that happen uh, on another continent. Um, and that we do need to stand up for these values of democracy and human rights. And um, we will reach a point where we, we do have to oppose it where we see it. And uh, so it, 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 we're in very dangerous territory here. Um, and I look, we'll have to act with our, with our NATO allies and other countries to, to bring this about. So yeah, uh, China, uh, you know, my, my other eye is still on China. I, 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 I'm an, I, I, that's what I write on is China and Japan. Uh, but for the moment, I'm, I'm, obviously we're preoccupied with Ukraine, but um, uh, with what's been going on in China the last few years, I think uh, there's an aggressive unilateralism there that we should all watch. And if there's any good that's come out of these crises, I think that NATO and the West and the rest of the world has been galvanized uh, to, to act as one. And, um, now is a time for some creative solutions on this. Mm -hmm. Seems to me um, quick learning as well. Um, mm -hmm. One of our, um, the questions that came in was regarding Afghanistan and what was kind of a flat-footed, almost bureaucratic response that Canada had, you know, we're assuming people had emails and there were just a lot of mistakes that were being made, translators and families and, uh, and, and their fixers not being rescued in time, you know, a two-year evacuation timeline. But what you're describing here um, is going to is going to require very fast learning on the part of Canada, very quick assessment of the kind of um, you know decisions we need to make on on um, our military decisions we have to make on our strategic our military doctrine our strategic policy, um, how we navigate through the alliances with NATO where our lines are and we have to prepare the Canadian people for that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see um, do you see that as, as happening? And I mean, assuming that the, the US will come along in the sense I agree with your assessment completely on Biden, um, they will they will, uh, you know, if they have to engage, they will uh, when it, when the time comes. But do you do you see this as, as something that Canada will step up to the plate and do? I, I, I do. I, I believe I do think Canadians will. I, I think this is a, a, a moment of decision, a moment for leadership. Um, I think, you know, the question was, is Canada still a leader? And as you do this in our day-to-day -day lives, a leader is shown in time of crisis. And we're in a time of crisis. Yeah. And I, I, I'm confident that Canada will show leadership. And leadership is tested in time of crisis and leadership is shown in times of crisis and it's leadership rooted in who you are, in your core values, in your identity. And that's why I, I the second part of my talk, I talked about what those core values are, that Canada uh, has to be committed to democracy and the rule of law. Um, and that's what this conflict is showing. And as I said, when this conflict ends, and it will end someday, I cannot believe that Russia is going to be victorious in this. That even if, I, I, I sometimes, I mean, I, I, I can't read Putin's mind. I don't think, I, I would be afraid to read what's going on in his mind. Um, but I'm beginning to think that maybe his motivation seems to be punitive to destroy as much of the Ukrainian infrastructure as he can to punish the Ukrainians for going down the road of democracy and westernization over the last 10 years. And he may be su successful in the short run, but sooner or later, the Ukrainians will push him back and it will be time for Canada and other Western nations to step up to rebuild Ukraine. And I hope that happens sooner than later. I'm with you on that, on all of that. Well, John, I think that we could sit here and talk uh, for another hour. I am sure that uh, there would be more questions for the floor, and I would love to just sit here and, and uh, share ideas uh, in a yeah. conversation with you. But I have received the friendly notification that we've reached our, our time here uh, for this evening. 
Uh, yeah. But I just want to thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. For, thank you, for, Joy. For your um, just for your insights and this this wonderful um, frame that you've really given us, drawing on Sanlamo's speech for future directions. It is a time, as you put it, as cr of crisis. It is a time where we need great leadership quickly um, and thoughtfully. Yeah. And drawing Canadians uh, into the days that will come, whatever they may be. And I want to also thank all the alumni in this call and to let you know the Graham Center is alive and well, and uh, that we bring together the practitioners with the, with the uh, academics to, for, to educate global citizens. And as Joy said, the students at Trinity are global citizens. And come by, come to our events. If you want to get on our mailing list, just go to our website, Bill Graham Center at Trinity College, and you uh, are welcome to any of our events, which we'll go back to in person soon and hopefully meet some of our very impressive students who are the leaders of the future. Yes, well, I, I can you. personally attest to how wonderful the Bill Graham Center events are. Um, and just so thank you on behalf of the Office of Development and Alumni Affairs uh, at Trinity College, I wanna thank you for participating tonight, John, and Thanks. for the opportunity to, uh, to be in this conversation with you and uh, just for your insightful presentation. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Thank you, everyone, for coming. All the best. And, and have care. a great evening. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.